Welcome to HSC Economics Made Easy. This video will wrap up the series on the year 11 topic of markets. See the links in the description below so you can watch my previous videos on this topic. In our previous lesson, we learned that markets play an important role in achieving allocative efficiency in an economy. But markets can also have unsatisfactory outcomes, which we call market failures. This includes demerit goods, merit goods, and public goods. Demerit goods are goods with negative externalities, which are the social costs not taken into account by the price mechanism. Cigarettes are considered a demerit good because of the social costs, such as the nuisance, the pollution, as well as the health issues that arise from smoking. Merit goods are the opposite. The price mechanism doesn't take into account the positive externalities or the social benefits, and therefore it's left undervalued and underproduced. I think of education as a merit good because not only is it good for the individual student, but an educated student has much to contribute to society, such as greater productivity, ideas, and innovation, and so on. Public goods are defined by the characteristics of being non-excludable and non-rival. These characteristics means that no supplier wants to supply these products because there's no profit to be made. So these are three forms of market failures, and government intervention is often the way to solve them. The forms of government intervention that I'll explore today can be categorized as price intervention or quantity intervention. Let's start with unpacking price intervention first. Price ceilings are when the government places a higher price limit below the market equilibrium. I think of it like this. Imagine this little man represents the price of the good. He's trying to reach equilibrium and the ceiling is there to stop him. A common mistake is to put the ceiling above the equilibrium. That's just redundant because he wouldn't get any higher than equilibrium anyway. So again, price ceilings are an upper limit on price that sits below the equilibrium price. Examples of price ceilings aren't very common because most policymakers know that they cause more problems than they solve. One of the most obvious problems is the disequilibrium it creates. As you can see in this diagram, when the price is set below equilibrium, demand expands and supply contracts, causing a shortage. We saw this happen in New York's rent control measures, which was an upper limit on rent. As prices were below equilibrium, there was an expansion in renters, but a contraction in supply. What did a contraction in supply look like in this rental market? First of all, many landlords who had mortgages to pay would no longer afford it. So they defaulted on their loans, causing prices to fall. This could appear as good news in the short term, but it meant that there were less incentives to invest and build new properties in New York, leading to an ongoing shortage. Existing properties also saw a lack of incentive to upgrade, leading to degradation of the quality of apartments. Energy prices are also often the subject of debate when it comes to price ceilings. Sure, it would seem good for the household budget, at least in the short term. But how do you think energy companies would respond? What do you think would be their arguments? How would this market look in the long term? Next, let's talk about price floors. This is a lower limit on the price that's placed above the market equilibrium. Just like before, I like to imagine a little man representing price trying to get to the equilibrium, but we've placed a floor there to stop him. Also, just like price ceilings, price floors create a market disequilibrium, but this time supply exceeds demand, causing excess supply. In 2017, the Western Australia Health Minister backed the idea of a price floor on alcohol because he understood that by increasing price, demand would contract. Does this mean alcohol suppliers would earn more revenue? Yes, the price elasticity of demand for alcohol is inelastic, which we learned a few lessons ago, increases total revenue. Which brings me to my next point. Considering that demand for alcohol is very price inelastic, would this plan really work to reduce consumption or just increase revenue? A more advanced example of price flaws in Australia is the minimum wage on the labor market. In this market, the good is labor and the price paid for them is wages. Supply represents workers while demand represents employers or jobs available. The minimum wage is a price floor and as you can see here, it causes supply to exceed demand. This means that there are more workers in the amount of jobs. In summary, minimum wage can cause unemployment. The minimum wage causes businesses to not be able to afford workers and they end up either closing or replacing them with machines, such as self-serve checkouts. This price disequilibrium is just one of many problems of the minimum wage, and we'll go into more detail when we focus on labor markets later in the course. So price ceilings and price floors are price interventions. Let's now look at some quantity interventions. The quantity of demerit goods can be reduced with a tax on it. Last lesson, I used this diagram to show a social supply curve as well as the private supply curve. The difference between them is what would have been social costs if they were taken into account in the price. 
So the idea of putting a tax on this is to make the price reflect the social costs. We call this internalizing the externality. In this diagram, you can see that the tax causes the supply curve to shift to the left, increasing price and contracting demand. This is why the government puts taxes on cigarettes. It's to make the price reflect the negative externalities and discourage consumption. But as you know, because cigarettes are price inelastic in demand, they're more effective in raising revenue than they are in reducing consumption. Next is subsidies for merit goods. Merit goods are undervalued because their social benefits are not taken into account. So in order to increase the quantity, subsidies are used. Subsidies cause the cost of production to fall, therefore shifting the supply curve to the right. This causes prices to fall and demand to expand. As mentioned before, education is a merit good. This is why the government subsidizes private schools on top of providing public schools. The last quantity intervention that we'll look at is the public sector. The public sector is made up of enterprises and institutes that are owned by the government. The public sector is essential for providing public goods. As we've established last lesson, because public goods are non-rival and non-excludable, no private firm wants to provide them because there's no profit to be made. So any public good that you could think of, it's probably owned and run by the local, state or federal government and funded with taxpayer funds. Of course, the government plays more roles in an economy than what I've outlined in this video. I haven't explored their roles in income distribution and stabilization of economic activity yet. That's because this video is more focused on the role of governments in markets. We'll cover more government intervention in future topics later on in the year. So that brings us to the end of my series on markets. I hope that this video and the series has made the topic easier for you. If it has, please leave a like, comment and share the video too. Our next year 11 topic will be labor markets and there are some pretty complex concepts in there that I'm keen to make easy for you. Hit the subscribe button and follow us on Facebook to make sure you don't miss future videos. See you next time.